Welcome to the Economist in Your Ear podcast. What if the world's economy wasn't just, you know, growing steadily, but was actually poised for an exponential explosion? And what if the very technology promising that incredible leap artificial general intelligence also harbored, well, hidden constraints, these deep structural bottlenecks that could dramatically slow everything down? Today, we're exploring a truly captivating idea, one recently highlighted by The Economist. It's this notion that AI could accelerate global GDP growth to, well, an astonishing 20-30% a year. That would fundamentally reshape markets, labor, assets, just about everything, in ways we can barely imagine. That's right. And our goal here isn't just to summarize that uh, that bold forecast. We're going to put it under some pretty intense scrutiny. We'll examine the foundational assumptions behind these, well, really radical projections. We'll pull in supplementary insights, contrasting perspectives, you know, try to offer a far more complete picture, highlighting both AGI's immense promise and the significant caveats that, frankly, often get overlooked. By the end, you should have a much clearer, more nuanced understanding of what this vision really means for our collective future. Okay, so to really grasp the sheer audacity of this forecast, maybe let's quickly anchor ourselves in history. Right. Because for centuries, right, before the 1700s, the world economy pretty much stagnated. We're talking, what, 0.1% growth annually? Glacial? Glacial is right. At that pace, it takes nearly a thousand years just for global production to double. It's hard to even comprehend now. Exactly. Then came the Industrial Age, and then things started to, well, hum a bit. Between 1700 and 1820, global growth quintupled, up to 0.5% a year. Still slow by today's standards, but a huge shift then. Right. And by the late 19th century, it was up to 1.9%. Then the 20th century, we averaged 2.8%. Suddenly, production doubled every 25 years. Growth didn't just become normal, it accelerated dramatically. Now, imagine shattering that historical pace, not just with factories, but with a new kind of intelligence. If you listen to the, let's call them evangelists, in Silicon Valley, that bang is about to get much bigger. Mm -hmm. They're claiming artificial general intelligence, AGI, AI, that can outperform most people at most desk jobs, could soon lift annual GPP growth to an incredible 20-30% a year, maybe even more. And they do point out, you know, while that sounds preposterous today, yeah. so did the very idea of sustained economic growth for most of human history. Yeah. It's a fair point about perspective. Yeah. What's truly revolutionary, though, is the underlying theory here. This isn't just about AI automating, you know, the boring, repetitive tasks. Right. It's about AI enabling what some call runaway innovation. The core idea is that AGI can supercharge GDP per person by generating entirely new ideas and making technology itself better all without needing more people. Okay, so automating the automation process almost. In a way, yes. Automating the hardest task of all, making technology better, improving innovation itself. That's the real potential game changer. You have groups like the AI Futures Project forecasting almost fully automated AI labs doing cutting edge science, maybe by the end of 2027. Wow, that's soon. That's the forecast. And Sam Altman at OpenAI, he's predicted AI systems might start producing genuinely novel insights as early as next year. Novel insights, not just pattern recognition. Exactly. This is the promise of sort of infinite inventiveness, a self-improving innovation engine. Which really pushes economic theory to its limits, doesn't it? It leads to that concept of the singularity, hmm. where output could theoretically become infinite. Nobel laureate William Nordhaus described this. Less as a prediction, more as a kind of uh, thought experiment showing how radical these models are. Right. Illustrating they must eventually break down under their own logic, perhaps. And if we connect this to the societal impact, well, it raises big questions about workers. Here's your worry. The traditional worry, yes. Human labor, especially desk work, becomes increasingly redundant. If AI can do your job cheaper, your wages eventually hit a ceiling, maybe even decline. Mm. This could fundamentally reshape the economy, leading to a world where income flows primarily to the owners of capital. You know, the people who own the AI, the data centers, the IP. So the rentiers, yeah. as economists call them. People earning from assets, not labor. Precisely. They become the only truly secure group in that potential future. Okay, that vision of limitless automated growth is... Well, it's compelling. Maybe a little terrifying, but definitely compelling. But when we start to dig into it, what's the first major sort of red flag that jumps out? Where do these models maybe make too big a leap? Well, the sheer scale of investment in these recent macroeconomic models, assume the ones spitting out those 20, 30 percent growth numbers, often relies on what you could only call heroic assumptions. Heroic assumptions. Also. And they tend to get overlooked. Let's start with capital expenditure, CapEx. The EPOC model, for instance, suggests optimal AI capital spending could be, get this, 
$25 trillion. This year alone. $25 trillion this year. What's the reality? Well, contrast that with today's announced mega projects in AI. Add them all up. You barely get to half a trillion. C fight $5 trillion. So a factor of 50 difference. Something like that. Even the really big, ambitious stuff like OpenAI's Stargate project, this huge data center campus, it's already being scaled back. They're running into land use issues, supply chain snags, real world problems. Right. So the gap isn't just funding. It's, it's a chasm. It's a fundamental mismatch between the ambition and what Wall Street or even engineering thinks is feasible right now. Absolutely. The implication is clear. Financial markets, engineering realities, they are nowhere near funding the trajectory these models need. It's a vast difference. Then there's energy and hardware, another huge one. Ah, uh, yes. The power problem. Exactly. These explosive growth models often assume hardware and power just scale smoothly. Infinitely, almost. Nordhaus's framework, for instance, assumes infinite energy elasticity. Meaning? Meaning, basically, every time you double compute power, a new power plant just magically appears to fuel it, like a limitless energy vending machine. Okay, yeah, that sounds optimistic. What's the actual energy picture look like? Not quite so magical. The International Energy Agency, the IEA, they project data center electricity demand will more than double by 2030, up to around 945 terawatt hours and AI is the main driver. Doubling in just a few years, and can the grid handle that? That's the multi-trillion dollar question. CSIS, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, they explicitly call electricity the most acutely binding constraint on US AI capacity. And it's not just about generating power, it's getting it connected. Right, the transmission lines, the substations. Yep, the US grid connection queues, they already top 2,000 gigawatts. That's enormous. And the wait times. Average approval time is five years. Five years just to get connected, assuming you can even get the power generated. So AI's growth is literally being held hostage by old-fashioned infrastructure, kilowatts and power lines. Precisely. Without a parallel energy revolution, fusion, radical efficiency, something growth could stall on a very old bottleneck, just getting enough juice. And it's not just energy. Many models also assume no regulatory drug. Meaning? Meaning data flows freely across borders, safety rules don't exist or don't slow things down, antitrust issues just resolve themselves. Friction-free scaling. But that's not what we're seeing at all, is it? Not even close. Look at the EU's AI Act yeah. or the NIST audits happening in the U.S. These imply multi-year lags between a lab demo and actual widespread deployment in the field. So real-world speed bumps. Innovation might be fast in the lab, but getting it out there safely and legally takes time, significant time. Exactly. That's a major slowdown, not friction-free ascent. Yeah. And then there's the financial markets angle again. If this economic explosion is really coming, you'd expect bond markets to price it in, right? You'd expect soaring real interest rates. That's basic economics, the Ramsey rule. Future growth expectations should drive up today's cost of capital. Makes sense. Yeah. But what are the markets doing? Well, interestingly, a new MIT study found bond yields actually tend to fall around major AI model releases. Fall, not rise. Why? It suggests investors either see AI as disinflationary, maybe making goods much cheaper, or they simply doubt the whole explosive growth scenario altogether. They're not buying it. That's huge. Because if Wall Street isn't buying the turbo growth story... Then the discount rate arithmetic in many of these models just collapses. Right. The whole financial underpinning gets shaky. And that assumption of instant capital reallocation... Doesn't hold up either. History shows real interest rates rarely outrun sustained economic growth for very long. Capital doesn't just teleport to the highest return instantly. Okay, so we have capital constraints, energy constraints, regulatory constraints, even market belief constraints. Let's widen the lens a bit. What about distribution and geopolitics? Yeah, this is crucial. The initial narrative often simplifies things to, you know, Silicon Valley rentiers versus displaced desk workers. A bit simplistic. Very. Because if the key resources, the compute power, the massive data sets, the advanced chip fabs remain heavily concentrated, say, in the U.S. and China. Which they largely are now. Right then the economic gains and those new superstar wages for the top AI talent, they're going to accrue mostly in those specific geographic clusters. And what does that mean for everyone else, the global south, for example? Well, this concentration doesn't just keep the wealth there. It can actually export costs. Yep. Think about energy price spikes globally as demand surges or increased debt service costs for developing nations competing for resources. Now, there's a climate angle, too. Right? Absolutely. Yep. A potential negative feedback loop. 
If AI relies on carbon-intensive grids, that means higher fossil fuel demand, more emissions. Which leads to more climate regulation. Which could then further slow down AI deployment or make it more expensive, it's complex. And crucially, none of the explosive growth models really internalize that geopolitical drag. They don't build those frictions into their calculations. Okay, so given all this talk about potential explosion, but also potential concentration of wealth, the common advice you sometimes hear is simple. Just own capital, own the stocks, own the assets. Is it really that simple for investors? Feels like there's more to it. Yeah, it's it's a really key question because the complexities for investors are immense. It's far from simple. Consider this paradox. Explosive growth combined with potentially soaring real interest rates. That combination could actually have the net present value of long duration equities. Even if their earnings outlook is fantastic. Even then, it's this tug of war. Future earnings might look amazing, but if you discount them back to today at a much, much higher interest rate, their present value drops significantly. Okay, so stocks might be tricky. What about just holding cash? Seems safe. Cash looks safe, maybe, but only if central banks can keep pace with everything. History suggests that during these huge, almost wartime-like technology shocks, policymakers often lag behind. What happens then? You might get inflationary resets first, a burst of inflation as the economy adjusts, followed by a period of what's called financial repression. Where the government kind of mm -hmm. uses low rates to manage its debt, potentially eroding the value of cash savings. Exactly. So cash isn't necessarily a safe harbor either. What about tangible assets? Land. It's finite. True. true. Land is finite. And one theory is a super intelligence might want to cover the earth in solar panels and data centers, bidding up land prices. Makes sense. But spiking interest rates can absolutely swamp those scarcity premia, that extra value you pay for something rare, like land. The cost of borrowing could become far more important than the land's inherent rarity. Imagine trying to refinance a mortgage at 20 or 30 percent. Ouch. Yeah. Okay. So the asset pricing is way more complicated than just own capital. Far more nuanced, yes. So if the explosive 20-30% growth scenario seems, well, unlikely in the near term due to all these bottlenecks, what is a more plausible roadmap? What should we realistically expect for AI's economic impact? Right. Let's get more grounded, looking at some of the supplementary thinking for the, say, 2025 to 2027 horizon. The next few years. Yeah. The likely binding constraints seem to be GPU supply, just getting enough chips grid interconnects, like we discussed, and the initial pilots of safety regulations finding their feet. And the growth impact. Plausibly a productivity bump. You'll see it in areas like code generation, design, customer support, specific sectors. This might lead to global GDP increasing by maybe, let's say, half a percentage point annually, plus 0.5%. Okay, significant, definitely useful, but not 20%. Not even close to 20%, no. A boost, not an explosion. Then, looking out further, maybe the 2028 to 2035 horizon, the constraints probably shift. Now we're talking more about the big energy build out, finding enough specialized AI talent, maybe data bottlenecks becoming more apparent, and also likely increasing geopolitical friction export controls on chips and AI tech. What kind of growth then? Could see more of a sector skewed boom, big gains in cloud computing, biotech using AI for drug discovery, maybe defense applications. But this could also lead to rising dispersion to bigger gaps in wages between AI savvy workers and others, and bigger differences in growth rates between nations. Okay, so a more uneven landscape. And beyond 2035, the longer term. That's where it gets really uncertain. Highly uncertain. It's only if we see major breakthroughs in those fundamental constraints, things like fusion energy finally working, cheap grid scale storage, or some other radical efficiency improvements. That the bottlenecks might loosen enough. Exactly. Then maybe that Nordhaus GN loop information, producing more information, accelerating innovation could potentially kick in. But that's a big if. A very big if, far from guaranteed. And we should remember, there are dissenting views even within The Economist's own reporting. Duran Asamoglu at MIT, for instance, he estimates AI might lift global GDP by only 1-2% in total over a whole decade. Wow, that's vastly different. Totally different scale. Or, Tyler Cowen's point, the stronger the AI is, the more the weaknesses of the other factors bind you. Meaning the non-AI parts of the economy, regulations, infrastructure, human skills become the real choke points. Precisely. And the economist Philippe Aguillon even raises the idea that a superintelligence might eventually just 
run out of useful ideas, diminishing returns to innovation, even for AI. That's a fascinating counterpoint. And mm -hmm. it brings us back to something you mentioned earlier, implicitly this idea of Baumol's cost disease. Mm -hmm. Reminds me of that old observation, you know, your computer gets exponentially cheaper, but your haircut costs more every year. That's basically it. Yeah, it's a real economic concept. Yeah. While AI produced goods, digital services, maybe even scientific discovery might become incredibly cheap, oh. abundant. Yeah. But those labor intensive services, child care, elder care, teaching, maybe even eating out there, Al, they could become disproportionately expensive because the human labor involved doesn't get the same productivity boost. So this dynamic could actually limit the measured economic growth, right? Even if we feel richer in terms of cheap goods. It could. It's a really subtle but critical point about how we actually measure prosperity and how growth impacts our daily lives, not just the aggregate GDP number. So let's try to wrap this up. The central tension we've explored today seems clear. While AGI's potential is undeniably vast, maybe even transformative. Absolutely. Expecting that 20, 30% world GDP growth anytime soon. It seems, as the sources strongly suggest, more a thought experiment than an investable forecast. I think that's a fair summary. The core takeaway for you listening is probably this. Investors, policymakers, workers. We should likely plan for a pretty messy, bottleneck-ridden decade ahead before any kind of eureka all day long economy could plausibly emerge. So manage expectations for the near term. Exactly. The consensus view on AI's economic effects might be just as behind the curve today as past predictions about AI's capabilities often were. The real challenge isn't just understanding AI's promise, but navigating the hidden, messy mechanics of its integration. It's likely a decade of friction before any truly exponential phase, and that demands a new kind of human ingenuity just to manage the transition. Okay, so perhaps a final thought for our listeners to mull over. Given these near-term constraints, these bottlenecks, but also the longer-term transformative possibilities, how might you rethink the role of human ingenuity, human collaboration, in navigating what could be a really challenging yet ultimately world-changing period ahead? 